Father God, we uh, lift Paul to you now this morning. Will you bless him with the words to say? Anoint him, Lord, to speak powerfully for you this morning. Open our hearts and our ears and our minds to hear what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He has risen ridden into the city on a donkey. And the next morning, he's cleared the temple out of traders from the temple courts. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. And so Jesus is questioned, firstly in the previous chapter, about his authority for his actions, and now his op opponents return the next day with questions to catch him out. The Pharisees with the Herodians came first, with the first question, after attempting to butter him up and put him off guard. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we, they asked. If Jesus said they shouldn't pay their tax, the Herodians, supporters of Herod, the Roman's puppet king, would have reported him to the Roman authorities for inciting rebellion and revolt, a capital offence. The tax, but the tax was hated by the Jewish people. The Romans only levied the tax on those they had conquered. Roman citizens were exempt. And apart from the poverty aggravated by the heavy taxes, the Jews were supposed to be the people of God. And here they were paying tribute to and funding a foreign Gentile power. And in addition, the coin used to pay the tax had a picture of the emperor engraved on it in contradiction to the command in Exodus, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above or on earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And the writing around a typical Roman denarius would read Augustus Tiberius, Son, son of the divine Augustus. And on the back, high priest, son of a god. If the Romans had purposely set out to offend Jewish sensibilities, they could have done no better than the image with a claim to divinity on the coins. The tax was hated by the religious establishment and the poor alike. So when Jesus, when answering the question, asked them to show him a coin and asked whose image and inscription were on it, then Jesus gives his answer. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I'm always surprised that Jesus' answer satisfied those who hated the tax particularly the zealots among the crowd that followed Jesus because he was in effect, in effect telling them to pay the tax. However, we must realise that going back 200 years to the Maccabean Rebellion, the revolt against the Syrians, one of the slogans of that revolt recorded in the first book of Maccabees was pay back to the Gentiles in full and obey the commands of the law. The similarity of Jesus' answer, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, to the cry of the Maccabean rebellion would have re resonated with the zealot element in the audience and no one could accuse him of inciting rebellion as he was telling them to pay the tax. 
The second part of Jesus' answer, and to, go, and to God, what is God, challenges us, as well as those hearing his answer. They would have understood the Genesis story, just as we do, <coughs> where a man was created in the image of God, just as we do. All humans owe their lives to God and should give him their lives as one might give a coin back to Caesar. Given the temple context of the conversation, perhaps he was also suggesting that they needed a more complete worship. They're just bringing required sacrifices, but a giving of our whole lives to God. And what's he also suggesting? That a different kind of revolution was needed, not one of violence, but instead a bringing of and a transformation in our lives to the service of God. The second question in our reading is asked by the Sadducees. These were the Jewish priestly aristocracy. They did not like the Romans, but they were doing quite well out of the society at the moment, thank you very much. And so they didn't like anything like the revolutionaries or messiahs or anything that threatened to rock the boat. They did not believe in the resurrection and they regarded the first five books of the Bible as the authoritative books. Ideas such as the resurrection that appeared in later books that they treated with suspicion and additionally, the idea of the resurrection was also popular with the Maccabean Revolution a couple of hundred years earlier. If the revolutionaries were to be rewarded for their dedication and sacrifice, they were more likely to take risks in their struggle. So, as the ruling aristocracy, words of ideas such as revolution, struggle or risk were definitely not in their vocabulary. And so they came up with a story of the widow who was married to seven brothers in an attempt to ridicule the resurrection and to show how ridiculous the notion was. But Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? He reprimanded them on two fronts that they didn't know scripture, or perhaps it might have been more accurate to say that they were highly selective about the scripture, taking the bits that they liked and ignoring the less comfortable or difficult parts. But it's not just the ancient Jews that have fallen into this trap. Look at groups that follow the prosperity gospel, for example. But we must not point to others but we need to look at ourselves. We too can get too comfortable and not see the text that would challenge or correct us. But to return to Jesus' answer, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Resurrection is not simply resuscitation with the same human limitations and problems. Things will not be the same. We will be transformed. Jesus, when he rose, had a new body. He was not some disembodied spirit. Yes, he had a real body that could eat fish. In the New Testament, Revelation describes a new heaven and a new earth. It reads, Then I saw a new heaven, and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be, and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death 
or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. The old order of things will pass away and a new, different order will be established with new, real earth and new, real bodies. We must not be like the Sadducees and underestimate the power of God. Jesus knew that these questions were designed to trap him. His experience throughout his ministry of gradually increasing friction with the Pharisees and Sadducees, together with his actions of cleansing the temple the previous day, would have told him that some kind of clash was inevitable. He didn't need much discernment to figure that out. But Jesus' reply to the question showed a great deal of wisdom and discernment. He knew and understood his audience and the groups within it. He had spent time with people, often been accused of consulting with the wrong sort of people. He knew his scriptures, hinting at the creation story in his first answer and referring back to Moses in the second. And as we know from other scriptures, he was reliant on the Holy Spirit. We, we read that the Holy Spirit came down on him at his baptism, visibly like a dove. And Jesus of Nazareth quoted Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. And to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Perhaps at this point, it would be helpful to have a little look at the difference between discernment and wisdom. The dictionary definition of discernment is the ability to judge people and things well, or the quality of being able to grasp and comprehend what is obscure. So discernment gives knowledge about something or someone or about some situation. And the dictionary wisdom, the dictionary definition of wisdom is the ability to use your knowledge and experience to make good decisions and judgments. The well-known Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said, Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great as a knowing fool, but to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Perhaps Spurgeon was thinking, of the groups that challenged Jesus. They spent time studying the scriptures, but were blinded by self-interest and preconceived ideas that they failed to show wisdom, to make good decisions or judgments. Solomon famously asked for discernment. It's recorded in 1 Kings. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people <coughs> and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do as you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart <coughs> so that there will have never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal amongst kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, and keep my decrees and commands as David your father with, did, 
I will give you a long, a long life. God gave Solomon the discernment that he asked for and needed, together with some wisdom. But ultimately, Solomon's wisdom failed as he was tempted to worship the gods of his foreign wives. You can read that bit in 1 Kings 11. But coming back to the New Testament, to 1 Corinthians, we read, There to one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge, by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking of different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. So wisdom and knowledge, or discernment, can be given by the Holy Spirit. In fact, James instructs us, if any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So, as we draw to the end of this sermon, I'd like to leave you with one final verse from Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If we want true wisdom and discernment, then we need to come in humility, fearing the Lord. We need knowledge of the Holy One. So we must study and meditate on his word, letting it sink into our hearts and permeate our lives. As James said, we need to ask, spending time in prayer as we get to know him. And in humility, we must allow the Holy Spirit to transform us and transform our lives. Can we stand to pray, please?